now we are in the letter of 2 Thessalonians, and we're walking through very slowly. Very, very slowly. We've been in here now. This is part 9 of this, and we're only about halfway through chapter 2. So we're going to be here probably, I don't know, 18, 19 weeks. I love this. It's, I love to look at the ignored parts of Scripture. Not that 2 Thessalonians is, is ignored per se, but it's not one of the more familiar ones. It's not as common to study through as, as Galatians or Ephesians or some of those. So we're going to go through, we're going to continue on in this study called Stand Firm uh, throughout Paul's second letter to the church at Thessalonica. So we're keeping in mind as we walk through this, we have Paul has two major goals as he's writing and he accomplishes them in each of these parts. The first goal is this, to encourage believers who have been suffering persecution. He's writing to people who have endured some horrific persecution, and so he's writing to encourage them, to shore them up, to strengthen them, to help them, uh, to, to stand firm. And then also he's writing to clear up confusion about the second coming of Christ. So some people had come into the church and they had started to teach false doctrine, and they had started to say Christ had already returned and we're already living in the end times, and it had confused people, so Paul is writing to, to kind of clear that up. So he's talking about the end of the world. It's really fun for me in the sense of, uh, so when I was in college, I think I talked about this a little bit last week, but when I was in college, while I was taking eschatology, my two eschatology classes, which is the study of the end times, our pastor decided to preach on the book of Revelation. And so I said, great, it'll help me, and it'll inform me, it'll help me in this class. Well, we switched churches uh, throughout my, my time in college, and right when we got to that new church, the pastor said, we're really excited. The first week I was there, we're starting a brand new series in the book of Revelation. So I said, okay, uh, we, I've been studying through and I've heard it preached, but we'll do it again. And so we did that. We launched out into ministry. We were at this little church, uh, First Baptist Church in Chico, Texas. I don't know if anybody knows where Chico is. We had a little bitty church there, and we got there, and the pastor was so excited because the summer he was going to start a new series where in the book of Revelation. And so, church, I got, I got a little burnt out uh, with the book of Revelation and with end times and eschatology in general, and so it took me a long time until finally when I preached through it over this last year, and now you probably are thinking the same thing. But we're going into 2 Thessalonians, especially chapter 2. Paul is talking about the end of the world. And so these are really timely things. When we talk about this, the people around us in the world that aren't even believers are constantly asking questions about this and, and imagining this and dreaming about this and writing movies about all of these kind of things. And what we have, though, is truth. So we've been talking about this idea of this man of lawlessness. We've talked about him for a few weeks now, and we're going to enter into the story. I know if you're new for the Sunday night study, it's going to feel a little jarring because we're going to enter this in the middle of not just a chapter, or chapter, not just the middle of a paragraph, but the middle of a verse. And we're going to start in chapter 2, verse 8. We've been talking about this man of lawlessness. So Paul comes at it like this. He, he comes to them and says, people have been teaching that, the, that Christ has already returned, that the end is already here. And then he corrects them by saying, but listen, some things have not happened yet. There's going to be a great falling away from the church. And after the falling away, this man of lawlessness, who I believe to be the Antichrist, the beast from Revelation 13, he's going to rise up, and that's how you're going to know uh, what's what's going to happen in these in these uh, in these times in the future. So, past few weeks we've been diving into the character, the identity of the Antichrist, and now I want to press on in our text, and I want to consider some things this evening. Second Thessalonians chapter two. We're going to start. I'll start at the beginning of verse eight, and we'll move through verse twelve this evening. I know this is jarring. We're going to start in the middle of a sentence. And so I've tried to give some context to where we are. But he's been teaching about who this man is. So he says in verse 8, And then the lawless one will be revealed. The Lord Jesus will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and will bring him to nothing at the appearance of his coming. I, I don't think there's a better verse in this entire section than, than that. The coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's workings with all kinds of false miracles, signs, and wonders and with every wicked deception among those who are perishing. They perish because they, do not, they did not accept the love of the truth, and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a strong delusion, so that they will believe the lie, so that all will be condemned, those who did not believe the truth, but delighted in unrighteousness. I know this is kind of a... a a section, if you are new, to jump in is kind of a, a darker section to walk into. But what I love about this section is that the gospel is here and that there is a lot uh, for us to glean throughout this process. What's up, sweetie? Do you know what I want? Do you know what all 
I don't, honey. Wish I did. Sorry. Let's read this again, and then let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let me re reset and refocus. I'm going to read, starting verse 8, the lawless one will be revealed. That word revealed, I want to point out before we get going, is the word apocalypto in Greek, which is the Greek word, the title for the book of Revelation. So there's a big connection there. This is an unveiling, an uncovering. So the lawless one will be revealed. The Lord Jesus will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and will bring him to nothing at the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is based on Satan's workings with all kinds of false miracles, signs, and wonders, and with every wicked deception among those who are perishing. They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth and be saved. So for this reason, God sends them a strong delusion that they will believe the lie and all will be condemned, those who did not believe the truth but delighted in unrighteousness. Let's pray. Father, I, I pray, Lord, that you would speak through this text to show us that even in these kind of darker parts of Scripture, we see the whole gospel. We see your wrath against sin, and we see your offer of salvation through Christ. You, you, it is your desire that your people be saved. And I pray, Lord, as we study this, that you would, you would strengthen us and equip us and encourage us through this text, as Paul originally intended to do for the church at Thessalonica. I pray, Lord, that you would, that you would accomplish that same goal in us, that you would help us to stand firm when, when the world's pressure is, is coming down around us. We love you and we thank you so good to us. We praise your name this evening, and we, we do all things for your glory and in the name of Jesus. I found her. Me? Chloe was looking for you. <laughs> so last week we started this outline, and so there's a reason why your first blank on there is going to be really short, but not a lot to fill in, because we've already taught through it. So if you want to go back and watch it, it's all on YouTube. But the first part is this, the Antichrist. Uh, we talked about this, number one. The Antichrist is being supernaturally restrained. The Antichrist is being supernaturally restrained. We spent some time on this last week just talking about the fact that uh, the, the Antichrist right now, I believe that, that, he is, that Satan is ready at any given moment to reveal him, but he's waiting on these events uh, to happen. And so he's being supernaturally restrained. There's a lot we could talk about there, but I want to keep moving. So number two, that was number one. Let's move in already to number two is this. The Antichrist will be supernaturally destroyed. The Antichrist will be supernaturally destroyed. Church, I love starting this way. You know when you watch a movie or when you read a book and you've got to go through hundreds of pages of the, the, you know, the protagonist going through all of these horrible things and, and you're wondering as you're watching the movie, is he going to make it? And I don't know about you, when, when you watch a movie with someone, uh, are, are, you a, are you a quiet movie watcher or do you like to talk and ask questions during the movie? I hate people ask questions. Oh man, so do I. Uh, we, we, my favorite is when we watch movies with Mindy's mom, and she will ask so many questions. Well, who is that? Well, why is, what is he doing there? Well, I thought he was with, what, no, no, is he a bad guy now? We watched almost half of a movie one time, and it was the movie Wonder Woman, and then Mindy's mom, halfway through, uh, an hour and some in, said, is this Wonder Woman? And I said, we've been watching it for so long. How could you not see? But... So, but we, we endure all of these things so that at the end we find out that our hero survives. But in this story, Paul just gives it to you straight up, right from the beginning. Hey, here's the end of the story. I'll talk about the Antichrist, I'll talk about his work, and I'll talk about what he's going to do. But at the end of all things, look what happens. Verse 8, the Lord Jesus will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and will bring him to nothing at the appearance of his coming one of my favorite verses, to, to, to just even think about it. It makes, it, and this may sound weird, but it makes my heart so happy to think that this is the Savior that we serve. That he looks and he says, this enemy that is set up against me is not even worth me drawing a weapon. I just have to breathe against him. So Satan sets up this man of lawlessness to be his false messiah, to entrap the world, and he gives him power, and he gives him influence, and he gives him all these abilities. The, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 13, the world looks at the beast and says, who is like unto the beast, and who can make war against him? This world fears him, and then Jesus breathes and wipes him out. I, I, to me, that is one of the most encouraging things when I consider the sovereignty of God and the omnipotence of of God. And I think about this, that all the heartache and hurt and despair and addiction and ruined marriages and temptation and wickedness that Satan has caused and affected in this world in one moment will be undone with a breath from Jesus' mouth. 
I, I, I praise the name of the Lord tonight for this. So this was actually prophesied 700 years before this moment. In Isaiah chapter 11, if you want to write that down, Isaiah 11, 4. This is what Isaiah says, talking about the root of Jesse, the coming Messiah. 700 years before Jesus, he says this, But he will judge the poor righteously and execute justice for the oppressed of the land. He will strike the land with a scepter from his mouth and he will kill the wicked with a command from his lips. This was prophesied all these years ago, and Job 4.9 also adds this, They perish at a single blast from God, and come to an end by the breath of his nostrils. Again, this doesn't sound like an encouraging idea, but if you were the one being persecuted, and you came to find out, and the, the Lord said through the pen of Paul, that, hey, your enemies are about to be destroyed, spectacularly destroyed. God will breathe and his enemies will be destroyed. To me, it's, it's a really encouraging idea. Knut Larsen is one of my favorite commentators, and I also love his name. I love to say Knut Larsen. Uh, just a very good, strong Viking name. Uh, he actually, right now, is pastoring my aunt and uncle's church in Michigan. And so, I, a little bit, you know when people meet celebrities, and, and they get all kind of hyped up? Well, when I found out, I, I, I said, can I send you one of his commentaries so he will autograph it for me because I was kind of excited to, to hear about that. But this is what he said. This will not be a long, bloody battle. This will not be a back-and-forth contest. Satan's chosen man will be destroyed by Jesus with one blow of his breath. I think that is fantastic. Did you have a question? Oh, no, I'm just... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I was ready for it. So I, I love this. Let's talk a little bit. Let's, let's dive deep a little bit into this when it says that the Lord Jesus will destroy him. Uh, so the NIV has a rendering that I don't that I don't care for. But does anybody else have uh, a different? Does your Bible say something different than destroy? Bring nothing. Bring to nothing. Yeah. Bring to nothing. Anybody else? Does anybody have the NIV? Because the NIV uses the word overthrow. So the oh, that's that's the one I don't I don't love because the word overthrow is not it's not strong enough. It's the do what? Kill. Kill. Awesome. That's more the sense of it. Overthrow almost has the sense of an army being defeated, but not necessarily being destroyed. And this, this, when he is using this word, it, it is very much talking about physical destruction, not eternal destruction. So we know that he's not just erasing the Antichrist into into like non-existence, because we know from Revelation 19:21 that the beast is actually the first one. The beast and the false prophet are the first ones to be thrown into the lake of fire. So uh, I, I love how Paul starts here, though. Before even talking about the Antichrist, before he gets into his power and his influence and, and what he's going to do in this world, he, he tells us the end of the story. He says, listen, no matter what happens, no matter how powerful he seems, the Lord Jesus is going to breathe and bring him to nothing. So that's, that's this. Number two is that the Antichrist will be supernaturally destroyed. And now knowing that, we can move into the end of this, into the middle of this story without fear. If you knew that whatever challenge that you faced, no matter what it was, like say you're, you're, you're entering into something new at work and it's, a, it's an incredible challenge and you're not sure how you're going to make it through. If you knew, if you got like a letter from yourself from a year in the future saying, hey, don't fear, you've, you've got this. Like, you handled it, and you did such a good job. Wouldn't that give us some confidence? Wouldn't that, it, we'll go into the challenge saying, I, I'm not afraid of this, we can handle this. I think that's what Paul's doing here. He's saying, listen, you're about to go through, it's going to get worse. These people are being persecuted, and he's like, it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. There's going to be a great falling away. The Antichrist is going to do all these things, but don't fear, because the Lord is already going to handle this. He's already promised handle this. Number three, let's keep walking here. The Antichrist will be supernaturally empowered. So he's going to be supernaturally destroyed, but in the meantime, while he lives and operates, he's going to be supernaturally empowered. Look at verse 9 with me. The coming of the lawless one is based on what? Before that. Yeah, Satan's workings with all kinds of false miracles, signs, and wonders. And in verse 10, with every wicked deception among those who are perishing. And they perish because they did not accept the love of the truth, and so he saved. There's some really interesting words here, and, and it's, I, I love how 
Paul uses some of these, these words and phrases where it says here the coming of the lawless one. That Greek word coming is the word parousia. And almost always, if you're, if you're a student of scripture, you may have heard this before, but almost always it, it is talking about Jesus and his second coming. So when we talk about anticipating Christ's return in scripture, it uses that phrase, the parousia of Christ, the, the coming or the appearance or uh, the, the return of Christ. And so what we see here is that word being kind of taken and used now for the Antichrist and his, and his coming. Satan is a counterfeiter. You're always going to see this in Scripture. We're going to see it especially at the end. His Messiah is going to make a crude forgery of Christ's return. He's going, to, he's, going to have, he's going to be a cheap imitation of who Christ is. So he's going to come with a demonic source of power. It says his parousia is based on Satan's working. That word is energeia in Greek, which is where we get our word energize. So he is... You remember the, the commercials? I remember this when I was a kid. You know, the commercials with that the energizer bunny... He keeps going and going and going and going. Many of you know we're talking about that the other day, how we remember commercials from the 90s. You know, that's, that's where I remember commercials. You may remember commercials from earlier than that. But how things change. And don't make fun of me. Listen, I was born in 1987, and this is all the life I've had so far. But even then, when I talk, when I talk to Chloe, uh, she's like, you were born in the 80s. <laughs> like, like it's the 1880s. <laughs> like, that was only 35 years ago. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Or sometimes she'll say, you were born before the year 2000. I'm like, thank you. You are now grounded. But we remember all these, the, these, these different old things. But I remember that the Energizer Bunny, you think, you think about that, the, the source of power, though, for, any, for anything, uh, that's, uh, that's what we're seeing here. The source of the Antichrist's power, the source of this lawless one's power, is not in himself, it is in Satan, and how Satan energizes him. Satan's wicked, malignant power energizes his dark champion. And right now, if you look at verse 7, where is this power right now? Verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. It's already at work. So right now, we know this, that same power that's going to raise this Antichrist up, and he's going to give him false signs and wonders, and he's going to help him deceive this world. He's going to energize him with this ability. In chapter 13 of Revelation, we see him mortally wounded and come back to life in a, in a pale, crude imitation of, of Christ and his resurrection. It, all of these same, the same power is already at work in this world. And, and that's not a thing that shocks anybody, is it? To say, hey, Satan is working in this world. Is that something where you're like, oh, I never thought that it would be that way. No, we look around, it's, it's everywhere. It is everywhere. Church, I saw a, an advertisement this week on Facebook uh, for a church, and I don't know where it is. It was called Trinity Lutheran Church. And they're having a, a drag show at their church. It, it's called Drag Me to Church. And it's not around here. I saw it on an, on an ad from a Bible teacher that I, that I watch. I, I look at that, and I think, okay, so it, it, is, it is evident, and it's plain, to me, that Satan's working is already here. It's, it's already working. It's already uh, fulfilling its, its intent, which is to deceive this world. Brother Mark, isn't it sad that we, we will know that Satan has work, but then we question whether God's at work? Yeah. 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 And, and to me, it, it is, it's one of those situations where I think Satan's work is very big, rash and obvious and God's work sometimes in our lives is, is difficult to discern while we're in the midst of it. And often it's like later we look back and say, well God was, God was strengthening me and he was working in me, I just didn't see it at the time. Like Jesus, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, uh, I think it's in John 15, Jesus says, my father is always working and so am I. Uh, I love that idea that Christ is, is he's, he's never, uh, his, his work is never stopped. But in the midst of this, that's when the lawless one is going to be revealed. Remember, that's the word apocalypto, which is uh, this, I, this, this revelation, or this uncovering. And what's going to accompany him is signs and wonders. Signs and wonders. This is really significant because this is what the world has asked for since the beginning. We want signs and wonders, and they're going to buy this hook, line, and sinker. Every person who's ever asked for a sign, when the Antichrist comes, they're going to get it. 
They're going to get exactly what they asked for. Show us a sign. Even today, if God would just show me a sign, I'll believe in him. Well, they're going to see signs and wonders. They're going to see things that we cannot explain. And, and that shows us a couple of things. When we talk about the, the unseen world around us, the, the, the world of, of uh, spirits, that we understand that Satan has real power. He's not, he's not impotent. He is, he's, he has, uh, he's a real being with, with real legitimate power. And so he's going to create or, or work with, empower this counterfeit Messiah. And what he's attempting to do is replicate Jesus' ministry. He comes with signs and wonders. But Paul... He calls out the Antichrist here, and when it says, he says false signs and wonders, that's the word pseudos. Uh, it's, we, we use that word frequently in, in our world today. You know, uh, pseudo means like false or fake or counterfeit. Warren Wiersbe said this, and I think this is important for the church today. Miracles alone never prove that a man is sent from God. His message and his character must also be considered. So I, I think this is kind of dangerous because there are many churches today that... that that aim for and, and search out and pursue those, those miracles. We want to see miracles. We want to see God's visible glory fall. There are churches where, where angel feathers will, will fall down from the, the rafters and, and gold dust will, will swirl around. They'll say it's the glory cloud of God's presence. And we, we search for those signs and wonders. We want, we want healings and we want to see people. Uh, there was in, in that, in, in, at Bethel Church, there was that in, in Redding, California, there was a, the, one of the staff members, little girls, passed away unexpectedly and they put her in the church and they kept the police out and for four days they prayed for resurrection and, and it was this this big ordeal because we love those signs and wonders we want those things but Warren Pierce we made it clear miracles alone they don't prove they don't prove that this man this this lawless man or law a man of lawlessness was from God and they can't prove that why can't we trust miracles alone I mean if you saw someone get healed that that would hopefully make us stop and stop on our tracks, but why can't we trust that alone? Because Satan does them also. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because Satan does false miracles. We saw in, in the book of Exodus, as, as God uh, <clears throat> brought plagues down on Egypt, the sorcerers of Egypt replicated those plagues. And we, we don't know how. Maybe it was demonic power, maybe it was trickery or forgery, whatever it was, but he did. He, he did those same things. Uh, I always thought that it was really ironic too that they would he would they would multiply their plagues like hey you've got blood how about more blood you got frogs how about more frogs you got lice how about more lice I mean it seems like the real miracle would have been taking away what what had happened but that's that's not uh, going to matter but there's a consistent message in Scripture from beginning to end dissuading people and forbidding people from practicing witchcraft and from consulting mediums and from attempting to contact the spirit world. Why? It, not because it's not real, but because it is real, and it is dangerous. And with Satan's empowerment already at loose in this world, he's eventually, this is his goal, he's going to deceive this world, and that's the end result. That's what he's looking for. Yeah, great irony. Christ comes and he believes Satan. Satan comes and believes Christ. It's it just hmm. flabbergasted, like, how deceived. How? Yeah. I'm going to write that down. Thank you. I think our camera got it. I'm going to pretend I, that I came up with it. I'm just kidding. Yeah, he does that all the time. I, I do. Many people say something, I'll say, can I say that that came from me? And it's just like, well, why? Why don't you just attribute me? And I said, because we're one flesh. It's, it, it works. We're just all, we're in sync. We're just thinking, thinking all this. I'm glad this me you said that. <laughs> but the end result of all of this, the reason why Satan is doing all these things is death and separation from God. That's, that's what he wants from people. Verse 10, if you look at that with me, with every wicked deception among those who are perishing. They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth and so be saved. These are, when he's talking about perishing people, he's talking about unsaved people. They are they're headed toward destruction. And remember, this man is the man of destruction. He's the man of, of perdition. But this is Satan's goal, to trap people in their sin, to blind their eyes to the truth. He's, he's not holding back. We think about this sometimes, I, I wonder like how, a, how a, a modern church that has become so comfortable and complacent and soft is going to make war against a, uh, a, a, an enemy who is not holding his punches. He's not stopping. He, he, wants, he wants every part of you. He wants your family to be destroyed. He wants this community to be disrupted. He wants all of these things. This, and so we see here, 
that as the Antichrist works, Satan is going to empower him, and, and, it's, and it's, he's going to be successful. Uh, so in verse 10 it says, They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth, and so be saved. This is an important statement. It's what we would call a soteriological statement. Soteriology is the study of salvation. How a person comes to faith in Jesus. What are the components of it? So this is very clear. They perish because they did not accept the love of the truth and so be saved. Sinners are doomed because they reject the free gift of salvation offered in Christ Jesus. So we, we, need, we need to see this. Knut Larson said, these people, they follow the way of death. They willfully choose it, and thus they bear the responsibility of their own judgment. So they, this, is the, this is their choice. They, they've known the truth, and they've chosen not, not to follow it and not to, not to embrace it. And that's why Paul has worked and labored so hard throughout his ministry and throughout his letters to point people to Jesus Christ. Because that's the way. That's the way that we're going to see any kind of change. Because the truth that we're talking about says they did not love the truth. Well, the truth that we're not that we're talking about here, it's not an abstract idea. It's not like some vague notion of my truth is something and your truth can be something else. It's not even a collection of, of beliefs that we've kind of put together. Truth is a person and his name is Jesus. And as a person is saved, it's not about believing a doctrine, because I think there are a lot of people who do believe the things that they're supposed to believe. Like they, they, they know it in their head, but they have not come to the place where they've repented of their sins and trusted in Christ alone for their salvation. And so as, you, as, you, as we kind of look at this, there's, there's no other way to be saved but through Jesus. And that's why Paul has pressed so hard in this letter and in all his letters toward that goal, to, to push people toward Jesus, to point people toward Jesus, or as we saw this morning in Acts chapter 28, to persuade people to, to know and to trust in Jesus. I love what Gene Green wrote in his commentary, wrote one of the better commentaries on 2 Thessalonians. He says, a, per, a person's ultimate destiny is bound up in their relationship with the truth. So we talk about this, and, and it's a, a thing in the church now where we kind of come to a place where we say, well, uh, it, let's just agree to disagree. And, and I know I've said that on certain things in the book of Revelation, like we can disagree on certain things, but when it comes to the truth itself, who is Jesus and what did he accomplish for us, there, there's no wiggle room here. It's not like, well, my truth may be a little different. You may come to Jesus through some other way, and, and, and it's all going to work out in the end. Our, our, our eternal destiny is bound up in what did we do with Jesus? Did we believe in him as recorded in Scripture or not? So going back to context here as well, a false teacher came into this church peddling false doctrine. And so, again, we may be tempted to say, well, it's not the end of the world. We're going to agree to disagree. But Paul disagrees. He says... This, this wicked satanic power is already at work in the world. It's coming into the church. It's going to energize the Antichrist in the end. And the church's relationship to the truth, is, as revealed through Jesus Christ, is of eternal importance. That's why we study God's Word. That's why we go back to the truth of Scripture, to find Jesus here, to see what he's saying uh, to his church. So we know that the, the Antichrist is going to be supernaturally empowered. He's going to be able to do things that normal people cannot do. It's, it's, it's going to convince this world that he is somebody to follow and somebody uh, to, to worship. Number four. This is the saddest one. and if, Out of context, it's hard. You've got to come back next week so we can see the glorious resolution of to stand firm in the faith because that's going to be his next uh, encouragement. But number four is this. The Antichrist will be supernaturally successful. He will be successful. Satan is largely successful right now. And the Antichrist will continue that success to a point where the vast majority of this world will worship him. It's a difficult conclusion to come to, but it's consistent in the teaching of Scripture. Look at verse 11. For this reason. What reason? When you see that phrase, like, for this reason, or because of this reason, what should we do? Go, go back. Look at the context. Go back and see for what reason. So you go back and say, because these people did not accept the love of the truth, and so be saved. Because of that, because of their rejection of the truth, verse 11, for this reason God sends them a strong delusion so that they will believe the lie. This is a, this is a tough doctrine. And this is hard because you could look at this on the surface and say, well, uh, God, you could blame God for these people rejecting because he sent them a delusion and you could blame him for them not coming to faith in Christ. But verse 10 makes it clear. They did not accept the love of the truth. 
They, they didn't accept it. The, the offer was there because they could have accepted the love of the truth and so be saved, but they didn't. And in verse 12, they did not believe the truth, but they delighted in what? Unrighteousness. Unrighteousness. These people loved their sin and they wanted to continue in it, so God simply gave them what they wanted. God gave them what they asked for. God, that, that's, that's what's happening, just like he did with Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. Pharaoh had hardened his heart so many times Finally, it says in the book of Exodus, right before they left, that God hardened his heart. If this is what you want, then this is what you're going to get. We see it in, in Paul's other book, in Romans chapter 1, verse 24. God gave them over. God gave them over to their own lusts and their own desires. If this is what you want. Yes. Our problems are the predominant problem in America today, self-inflicted. Exactly. Yes, it's self-inflicted, definitely. This is, this is exactly what they wanted, and they're going to get what they wanted, and, and more. Knut Larson said this, In each case, the judgment is just, resulting from their own choices. Since they prefer lies, God gave them delusions. We must remember God does not cause these people to believe the lies. These people have repeatedly embraced wickedness so that their character is formed by evil. And then Wearsby adds this, The human heart becomes harder each time the sinner rejects God's truth, and it becomes easier and easier to believe God's lies. That's what, that's what we're seeing here. God's giving them what they've asked for, and, and they are going to believe Satan, and they're going to believe the Antichrist, and they're going to be deceived. Going back to context, though. Always go back to context. We've got to understand this. Paul here is not talking to unbelievers. Who is he talking to? He's, he's right now, in this moment, he's talking about unbelievers, but he is talking to the church. He's encouraging them. This should be an encouragement to them uh, in a couple of different ways. For one, the people persecuting them are the ones that he's talking about. He's saying, hey, these people that are persecuting you and putting you through this and, and being horrible and mistreating and, and even killing some of you, listen, they are the ones that are going to be, in, as, as verse 12 says, so that they will all be condemned. He's saying the people that are hurting you will one day be condemned. So take joy and, and take encouragement in that. They'll be condemned by a righteous God. The church's enemies will are and will become God's enemies. That's really good news for suffering people. I think about it always uh, just in raising kids, uh, this idea that has become so prevalent in, in bullying. In, in this world now where kids will mercilessly bully another kid, I mean, to, to cause horrible psychological trauma later in life. And you know, when we were kids, it, you, you handle things differently than you can now. Because you know what my dad's advice would have been if someone bullied me? Get it back Punch, him in the nose. Punch him in the nose. Just do it. Just, you know, but obviously we don't, we, we don't want to uh, give that kind of advice today and, and end up going to jail. So, but... <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a lot. We could explore that as a, as a rabbit trail at, at some point. But what God is saying, listen, the people that have bullied you, listen, they're going to pay for it. There's going to be a day when there's going to be judgment that's going to fall because of these people and what they've done. Then also, Paul is, by implication, talking about the gospel here. He, he's saying, listen, this is what they have done to, to find themselves in this place. In verse 10, they, they perish because they did not accept the love of the truth. And in verse 12, those, uh, those who did not believe the truth, but delighted in unrighteousness. He's saying this is, this is because of that, but the, the opposite is also true. So for God's people, if you love the truth and come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, and, do, and, and you believe the truth, and you delight in His righteousness, this is the life that God has called us to live. So there's, there's, the, the gospel is, is here as well. People who love the truth, believe the truth, and delight in God's righteousness, these are the people who are not condemned. And, and that's where he's pointing them. Listen, make sure, as, as false teachers are coming to the church, and as you're raising your kids, and as you're impacting the community, that you understand that, that there is a path towards salvation. And, and this, is, this is the way to go. The believers in Thessalonica needed to square up to this truth. We may experience hardship in this life for the believer there's joy to come. So no matter what they faced in this world, there, there's joy to come. It didn't matter how much persecution they faced because in the world to come, it would make it all worth it. It would make every single moment of this absolutely worth it. But for those who seem to win victory in this world, there's judgment and wrath that's on its way. So his, his goal, and I'm just going to read. Can we read just a little bit further so we can end on a really positive note? <laughs> so Satan is going to be, uh, the Antichrist is going to be supernaturally successful, but then in verse 13, 
But we ought to thank God always for you. Brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. Because from the beginning, God has chosen you. That's what I was talking about. The gospel is here. He's like, but that doesn't have to be your story. That story of, of the people who are condemned, that doesn't have to be you. We, God has chosen you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel so that you might obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus. How encouraging is this? 15, so then, brothers and sisters, what? Stand firm. Stand firm. And hold to the traditions you were taught, whether by what we said or what we wrote. And may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal encouragement and good hope by his grace, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good work in the world. I love that. I, it, you could almost end it there, but there's more to come, the, cha the entire chapter 3. We're going to start talking about uh, verses 13 uh, through the end of the chapter next week. But I want to end on a really encouraging note because he, he, it may look like... The enemy is winning, but he, he's pointing them to this truth that, listen, this temporary life is going to be over, and you're going you're gonna to attain what is the same, verse 14, he called you to this through our gospel, so you might attain the glory of our Lord Jesus. That's the prize, the glory of the Lord Jesus at the end of all things. Stand firm, no matter how successful the Antichrist appears, he will not survive his encounter with Christ Jesus. All right, let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you that I can trust right now that at the end of all things you will come back for your people and you will destroy your enemies with the breath of your mouth. You created all things and you'll undo it. And you'll create something even better, a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven that we will enjoy forever. You've made these promises to your people and we cling to them. Lord, ferociously we cling to them. The promise of uh, total redemption, total change of, of our bodies into glorified bodies where we will be with you forever free of sin and pain and hurt and, and tears. We thank you for that promise. We, you have, we have the promise that you will be among your people. You will be our God. We will be your people and we'll see you face to face. We'll spend eternity with you. We have the promise that no sin will ever enter this city, that we will your saints will enjoy the, the peace and prosperity of your kingdom forever. Lord, we trust in you. And it's not a, a trust built on just desperate hope, but it's a trust built on absolute confidence that your word is true and that it will come to pass what you have said. I love you, Lord, and I'm, I'm so grateful for um, this, this text that we walked through that no matter how desperate the situation looks and how powerful the enemy seems we know that he will bow before you that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord Lord, we will do it willingly as your church but others will do it unwillingly as your, as your conquered subjects before they're cast into hell I, I, I pray Lord that you give us time to reach more people with the, the message of the gospel so that this story didn't have to be their story but I thank you, Lord, for this promise that you are righteous and just and that you have provided a way for your people to be saved through the finished work of Christ on our behalf. We love you and we thank you for Paul and uh, what he wrote to the church of Thessalonica. Uh, I, I love how it encouraged them and it encourages me even today. Thank you, Lord. We give, all, we give all the glory, honor, and praise to you. You're worthy of it and more. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen.